Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, we've got 35 minutes to tell the story of um, a big family history, and I won't go into any of the island gypsy or Hong Kong stuff because we're here for a wooden boat festival. It, it all starts in a Norwegian winter, January 1887. A subsistence farmer, Halvor Andersen, and his wife, Ellen Marie, are living on a small farm. There's no electricity, there's no motor cars, there's no supermarkets, there's no washing machines. There's no any modern convenience that we consider essential. They are expecting their 10th child, which shows you what happens in Norway with no Foxtel. At <laughs> any rate, in order to fund this uh, venture of 10 children, Farming is not sufficient, so Halvor decides that he will walk 10 kilometres down the Nid River to the coastline to learn how to build boats. It's his only way of finding some prosperity. So he embarks on a course of boat building. Uh, no salary, no nothing, but actually he turns out to be a very good boat builder. He then later, we don't have any history of that time of him and what he did, but it was obviously prosperity because they ended up here on the side of the river and pay attention to this small ship in front because it's crucial to the story later. In the 15 or 20 years that he's building boats, his intervening time, his son on the 10th of February 1887, Lars Gustav Halverson is born. Father and son have a slightly challenged uh, relationship but Lars loves building boats as well, and his father is there to teach him everything he needs to know. They establish these premises, and away they go. Lars decides to go to America to learn modern techniques, and with some of the uh, very uh, modern and uh, more uh, contemporary boat builders of the time, Lars learns how to build bigger boats and better boats, and so therefore returns to Norway when his father dies, um, at age 77. By the way, Lars was 58, uh, no, Halvor was 58 when Lars was born. So Lars comes back, takes over this enterprise and starts building boats. This is prosperous for him. It's a great time. It's the First World War. It is the ability to build lots of boats and much better than just little fishing boats and clinker hull things. There's Lars in the middle with the, the hat on. And, and there's the staff, um, hopefully looking happy somehow or other. But they're doing very well. They are fortunate to have a house built next to them at the factory, um, courtesy of Lars's wife, Birgitta, who's there, and they embark on setting up a family. Um, these are Harold and Carl at a little dinghy that's the a typical type of boat that they would have built in those days. However, uh, at the end of the First World War, times are tough and there are no orders for Lars. And if you re recall that previous boat, he decides to go on a venture and build a 350-tonne cargo ship as a venture to make money. They're going to get into the shipping business. He has to get a partner in this venture and unfortunately, they launch it and it's a great boat, except they can't afford the insurance and on their first uninsured trip, the Nidelv uh, lands on the Musselwick Sands at St Bride's Bay in Wales on the 21st of July, 1921. Effectively, the family are ruined. Um, everything has to be sold, there's no work. The house has to go, the factory has to go, everyone has to be laid off. They have to start from the beginning. The only opportunity for work for Lars is, in fact, an introduction to someone in South Africa. So, Lars travels to South Africa in February 1922. The family follow him in December 1922, literally with just the luggage that they can take with them. Everything has been sold and they have to start afresh. Lars partners with a Mr. Lau, and it's hard to see in the photo, Lau and Halverson, shipwrights and boat builders. They are building some rather smart racing yachts and, and commercial vessels, but Lars realised that very quickly, with a, a growing family, which is um, the same Norwegian tradition, he's now got seven children in South Africa, and they're beautiful children, and they're beautifully taught and educated, but they've come to a land with English language. They, they are not able to find sufficient work in South Africa for the five sons 
to build a boat building business. There's three of the boys, the three eldest. So Lars receives another introduction to uh, travel to Sydney. He's told that it's the best harbour in the world and he's given the opportunity to build a boat. Here we are with the family, Harold, 9th of April, Carl, 9th of July, Elnor, Bjarna, Magnus and Trigg, and little Margaret, whose daughter is here and granddaughter, has, has yet to be put into the photo. In, in December, uh, in, in February, I should say, Lars travels to Sydney and then he sees Sydney Harbour and is heard to comment, if I can't make money building a boat here, I'll never make money building boats. He is given an introduction to a Mr George Robinson and he builds his number two. The first boat built is a little flatty dinghy, but number two is built in a shed in St George's Crescent at Dremoyne. Very quickly, he is established as a boat builder of some repute and high quality skills. That boat shed is too small, so in July 25, they moved to Careening Cove, which is Kirribilli, effectively, just up from the Royal Sydney Ot Squadron, and they start building boats there. They then get a couple of good orders for good yachts, high profile people, and then after that, by 1927, they find at the end of Ben Boyd Road at Neutral Bay, this boat shed, Lloyd's boat shed, uh, with a house up the top, um, all for rent, and they commence building there. The boat built in Dremoyne is with Harold Halverson is sent over from South Africa as a 14-year-old boy on a sailing ship to Adelaide. He finds his father on Christmas Day 1925 and they have started work. This is hard work for people with just tools and skills and not a lot else. But that's the ship. That's the, the unfortunately, the, the, the harbinger of doom, Nidel. But what a fabulous thing and what a tragic thing. But lucky for us, they came here. There's uh, Lars up the back, Harold shoveling, Bjarna up the back, Carl here with the wheelbarrow. None of the family were allowed to just sit idle. No one was doing anything but work. And it was hard work. And with a family of seven children, everyone had to get cracking. But immediately Lars is respected by everybody. You can see him down with the hat. That's Carl to his right, Harold at the back. And that's one of the cruisers. You've got to remember that a 38-foot cruiser such as that in 1933 is a really significant boat. This is not um, playtime boat building. They're very high quality and they're very much respected. However, this is the boat that puts them on the map. It's a 75-foot cruiser. They've built 65 boats. It's built for the managing director of Union Theatres, which is now Greater Union, Stuart F. Doyle. He was also the Commodore of the Royal Motor Yacht Club at Rose Bay. And through his social prominence, this 75-foot cruiser suddenly wows Sydney. It is the biggest boat in Australia. It is absolutely sensational. And whilst the interiors and some of the superstructure done by others, it's perceived to be a Halverson-built boat. It is absolutely the start of Lars Halverson in Australia. So here's the happy family. Um, obviously the boys up the top, everyone's dressed beautifully, everyone lives a very high standard of living. Uh, uh, Lars is a lay preacher and has religious faith, as does his wife, and that's obviously the thing that gets them through. They're all beautifully dressed, they're all beautifully mannered, and they are a remarkable family. During the Depression, 1930. Here's Carl. They built a speedboat. Any opportunity to try and make some money. So they've got this fabulous speedboat in the American style. And there's Carl with the hat and taking people. Thrills and fun galore. I think you'll find that's uh, Harold sitting in the seat there. And people clamouring to get on board. Something exciting to do. Carl was the quiet one in the family. All the others are fire sign people. And if you know your astrology, it's actually a catastrophic astrological disaster. Uh, which I can explain in the tarot card tent on uh, aisle D. Uh, loving a publicity stunt, this is the first boat exhibited at the Royal Easter Show. It's built for a gentleman in Perth, Ireland, and they tow it down Macquarie Street in the centre of the city uh, and then exhibit it at the Royal Easter Show. A rather remarkable sight in those days. One of Sydney's first trailer boats, and judging by the tow truck, it's... Uh, alarmingly primitive. 
a similar style of boat, the Pollyanna, which is still afloat in Perth, and it was built and in Sydney and then, of course, shipped to Perth. There she is, Pollyanna on Sydney Harbour. Again, 42 feet and, and rather a remarkable boat. By this time, Harold Halverson is building, uh, designing the boats. Lars is signing the, the plans, but Harold has turned into the, the star designer and his father can see it. Um, Harold born on the um, 9th of April 1910, so he was 24 at this stage, a young man. He couldn't be seen to be signing the plans, but he was actually a better, better designer than his father. This shows 1936 and obviously prosperity is going. There's the, the shed that they've leased, the house is up the back, you can't see. Lars has constructed this rather ramshackle um, factory on the side to continue with production and it's all going swimmingly well. Lars has put in an application to build a bigger factory next door, but tragically in August uh, 1936 Lars contracts osteomyelitis of the spine, which is a terminal illness in those days, and he dies on the 5th of October 1936. The shed gets built, and here we are. 26-year-old Harold Halverson and his 24-year-old brother are there to rearrange the family's affairs. And instead of it being L. Halverson Boat Builder, they form a new company, Lars Halverson Sons, being the five sons. Uh, eldest daughter, Elnor, doesn't want anything to do with it and marries a, a dairy farmer in the southern highlands. She's gone. Everyone else is involved, including uh, Mrs. Halverson, the widow. But thanks to Harold Halverson, as a 26-year-old man, as a fabulous designer and, and as a stalwart, upright fellow, and he's a pretty tough man, um, but charming, but tough, but tough. And so he, he is able to get that family galvanised and all working together to continue this prosperity. We can see that new, bigger shed, service work of boats being done, and, and really they've, they've, they've made a fantastic name for themselves. That was Harold's favourite design. It echoes a sort of Palm Beach 50 nowadays. Um, absolutely magnificent. There's a beautiful photo of Kari's mother in the back of this boat. In fact, that may even be her up on the foredeck. And that was Harold's favourite boat, a 50-foot boat built for Mr Harden, 1939. So the war comes to uh, Australia and it's a rather frightening episode. The Japanese are closing in quickly and Halverson's obviously building boats have a key to play. Harold designs um, wartime vessels. These are 38 and a 26 foot aircraft tender vessels. And that's another shot looking back at uh, Neutral Bay. And then all the, uh, the fashionable cruisers that were varnished and chromed and looking wonderful, 14 of them are requisitioned by the Navy and affectionately called the Hollywood Fleet. They're put into wartime service. And this one, particularly the Sea Mist, she was the one that on the night of the 31st of May 1942 when the Japanese midget submarines breached the Sydney Harbour defences, she was the one that depth charged it in, in Taylor's Bay at Clifton Gardens. Tragedy of those boats, of course, the depth charges drop into the water and that they have a very limited time to get away because of the depth. Um, she actually launched three depth charges before her port side motor was thrown off the engine beds and she had to retire. Nevertheless, they did better than the Japanese. This is 1941 uh, September. Harold has realised that we, they need war production. They purchase a five-acre block of land at Ride on the Parramatta River. Harold designs a shed, of which I have a copy of the original plans, and his father, Arthur Langham, father-in-law, I should say, Arthur Langham, uh, constructs the shed. These are the 38-foot air-sea rescue boats, uh, commonly referred to as crash boats, built upside down, turned up the other way, and they have got production up and running like a rocket. Um, to give you an idea of that, uh, the USS Chicago was the ship the Japanese submarines were after, and on that night in, in May, June 42, they had a 30-foot naval pinnace, careful how you say that, it had been damaged in action, and they took the engine and the bits to Halverson's and said, we need a new boat, and they built the new boat and sent it down the river, painted and finished in 10 days. 
So they, they were working hard. Now, Harold Halverson was a design master. That's a 38-foot uh, air sea rescue boat of, of owners who have restored one here, and there's one down on the marina. Look at the way that cuts through the water. There's virtually no wash on that bow. She's parting. And one of the American lieutenants, as they say, after the war said, I wish we'd had a 1,000 of them. They were our favourite boat. Uh, there's Carl delivering one, uh, February 45. They built 147 of those boats, 237 boats for the war. Here in the factory with the sides on the shed, you'll see a 112-foot fair mile over in the corner. This is one of Harold's designs in the middle, um, a 62-foot patrol boat, very much like a McHale's Navy PT boat, and that's a V12 Hall Scott petrol engine of 650 horsepower being put into it. A 38 there and another vessel of some description. They were just throwing them out the door as quickly as they could. That is the launch of that particular vessel, 1944, and the young fellow standing on the railing is Harold's son, Harvey Halverson, who ended up being the designer. These were a British-built boat. They'd roll on a wet lawn. They're very narrow, um, but they are uh, still a very much part of the war effort, 16 of them built by Halverson's. This shows the surrender of the Japanese in one of the islands. Uh, there's the Halverson table, no dry rot in that one. And that's one of the <laughs> Halverson built um, uh, fair miles with some rather surly looking Japanese, presumably. That was the factory. Uh, it was 350 feet long and 150 feet wide, one of Harold's 62 foot uh, vessels there. It was a, an incredible wartime effort and that's a shot from 1953. Everything came in there as raw materials, except they, they didn't have a foundry. They had chrome plating, they had machining, engineers, engines, everything. All the timber ca came in, six slipways, which were all interlinked, and so that was the work for 350 people uh, working at Ride at the height of their production. It was a tremendous effort and really uh, and you can see Harold there with sleeves rolled up in the middle and Carl next to him, some of the other brothers there. But everyone tremendously involved and, and a, a, a fantastic effort. That shows the shed. That's a later photo with a, um, a, car, a clinker hull vessel, but the, the door's obviously sliding in the six slipways. This is a post-war shot. That's a 60-foot cruiser, um, was to be called Sylph, or was called Sylph, um, very much like another vessel I'll show you in a minute. And Halverson's didn't just build pretty boats. This is a 75-foot trawler um, at, at its stern, which is this is it as a working vessel. Halverson's privately owned three uh, trawlers and had another company, Halverson Fisheries, operating off the coast. After the war, Bob and Head, the lease became available. One of the brothers was told by someone else, by someone else, that Sainty's boat shed at Bob and Head was available and... Harold signed a cheque and one of them was dispatched down to sign the contract with a Mr Wheat and they took over this boat shed. Immediately the staff at Ride were set to work building um, motor launches and rowing boats and of course the famous hire cruisers. Those hire cruisers um, started as a 25 foot boat as you see. Halverson's ended up with 63 hire cruisers and the total fleet was 225 boats available for rent. 120 staff there at its peak. It was like motel rooms, all needing serviced engineering, painting, whatever. Trig Halverson, he ran Bob and Head um, from a maintenance perspective, and this is Carl Halverson, who was the charming, lovely, lovely man, um, ran, ran Bob and Head whilst Harold continued running ride. That's Carl filling up a beautiful boat, Sirocco, built from Morris Smith, who was the managing director of York Motors. York Motors was the importer of most of the prestigious British cars and helped Halverson's get the contract for Morris Marine engines, which were in most of their smaller boats. Lord Nuffield, actually, who was William Morris, came to Australia at one point. So, and, and it was Morris Smith that told the New South Wales government to loan the money to Halverson's to build the shed at Ride, otherwise they wouldn't have got the, the money. Here's an advertising brochure from the, the 50s, of the 47 foot is a standard thing, obviously. They do get up and run a pair of Chrysler Royals. 
There's Hal uh, Halverson 50, the beautiful Penelope. It was a one-off. And here's the 60-foot, that one being built in the shed called Sylph. That one's called Taronga. This was Australia's first export vessel. Um, as it went to the United States in 1949. Um, and there's Carl Halverson at the helm with his signature cap. Fabulous looking boat. Um, and it caused a sensation. Sydney Harbour, obviously, with the backdrop. Um, Carl at the helm, Harold there, you can see, and I think that's Magnus over behind Carl. There she is being loaded onto the ship. Carl travelled on the ship with the vessel and she was offloaded at Long Beach. A little bit of press as she was taken down to Newport Beach, California, where Carl uh, basically made himself known and showed the boat off to people. But it wowed everybody. I mean, look at it, magnificent thing. Um, a, a Chrysler Royal Petrol Engine Straight 8s and everything just magnificent. Bob Hope happened to be on the wharf so Carl naturally invited him to go fishing and then made good friends with Dolores and Bob and that's the Santa Catalina Island where Natalie Wood didn't float. Um, Bob and Dolores Hope and there they are. However, the lovely part of the Taronga story is um, a gentleman asked to go for an afternoon run and it was a little bit foggy and the wonderfully named Belmont J. Sanchez um, went for a run with Carl and came back to the club to have dinner. Carl's at another table. Next thing, Sanchez writes that cheque for $50,000 and sends it over the, on the salver with the waiter and said, please give this to Mr. Halverson. Carl immediately took the cheque and put the keys of the boat back on, take it back to Mr. Sanchez. <laughs> Deal completed. And the Australian pound in those days um, depreciated the next day, so they ended up getting more than they had originally intended on buying it. That's Taronga today. Ian Murray, the yachtsman, brought her, bought her in 1989, brought her back and completely redid the, the, the boat, but wonderful to see and such a fantastic looking boat. The Seventh Day Adventist Mission were actually one of Halverson's best customers, and here's one of their island mission boats, a 65 foot vessel, and they they were obviously delivering Bibles and whatever they could round the islands. Um, Ampol, in their early days, had a cargo vessel built, 1947. So it wasn't all just pretty boats and varnish and chrome. This was a, a later wartime vessel that um, Harold designed, and you can see him standing under the mast, Magnus and Trigg with the sunglasses, and I presume Mrs Halverson down there, possibly with that fluffy hat on. Here we have the 38-foot crash boat, and after the war, this one, which has currently been restored, and the owners are here, the Nemesis 3. And she was bought by the, uh, the New South Wales Police, and that was the primary police boat on Sydney Harbour. These vessels had travelled through all sorts of weather. They were virtually bulletproof. They just went everywhere, and they were so, so loved by people that served on them in the armed forces. Harvey Halverson started designing the boats in the early 60s, and this is a later iteration of the police boat, a 40-foot V-bottom cruiser with a pair of Chrysler V8s. Same boat coming the other way, pushing through a, a, a wash. And these are some of the 26-foot um, V-bottom boats built for the police. Harvey, circa 1969, uh, the American... Um, connection had been good. They'd sent a couple of 47s over to America, two of which have come back to Australia very nicely. And this one, a 62-foot vessel built on spec and sent to Bradford's at Fort Lauderdale and Harvey at the drawing board. Sadly, that boat about five years ago was destroyed by fire in a yard in Canada. But beautiful looking boat. The 65-foot Atunga was a uh, oil rig crew tender to take people to the Bass Strait oil rigs. Whoever thought that was a good idea had never been in Bass Strait um, because absolutely dreadful. Uh, they built the first one and had two more of them framed up in that stage. And this is a Tunga launched. The uh, port of Sydney was closed that day and they did the sea trials to test her. Um, people later uh, went on her as a ferry in the Barrier Reef and called her the Achunga because I think they were all throwing up. A similar hull, uh, Banyanda and Kanahoe, were built for the O'Neill brothers who had Hymix uh, cement and uh, blue metal and gravel. Same hull, uh, V-bottom, 
All of Harvey's V-bottom hulls are actually virtually the same line drawings, deep four-foot flattening aft, full keel, uh, wonderful sea boats. That's her being putty, double diagonal planked, glued and screwed. There's Banyander going down in the slip, and his brother had the, the vessel Kanahoe launched at the same time. That's Kanahoe later when I owned her, um, very nicely. It was a beautiful boat. I think we used more champagne than diesel fuel, but there she was <laughs> after the decks had been done, and I did all the varnish and painting myself. That's a similar one, e exported to America, a 70-foot cruiser. That was another one sent on spec, sold to a senator from Washington, Senator McGuinness, three diamonds. And he, I love this photo, a little 25-foot boat. How happy would you be to turn up at ride and they're launching your snappy little boat and, uh, just down the slipway? What a cute little thing, 25 feet. They would have just been thrilled. Then Harvey did the V-bottom boat. So there's one of the police boats and the boat at the bottom, again, the same style of hull. And that is actually the first Halverson I ever owned, 1989, Olena. It was half sunk and I redid it with a new Chrysler V8 and put a flying bridge on it. And there were the lucky people I sold it to waving at me still, using most of their fingers. Uh, but a beautiful little boat. They, they ride particularly well in rough seas. They sit up so that that uh, forefoot can chop, uh, chop through any waves. That's the bigger model, a 32-foot Viking series in the sports style with no bulkhead. That one went to Perth back in Sydney. And then that is the Kakana, a 40-foot, which was the same as the police boat. The owner is here today, and she is absolutely pristine. was built to Sir Frederick Sutton, the car dealer for one of his sons, 1970. That's the slightly larger model. They built 14 of the 40s, two of the um, 42s, slightly bigger model, up in Queensland, one owner for about 28 years. And then that was one of the custom boats. I bought that. That's me at the helm. Someone said, I will race you, and they lost. Um, fantastic boat, that. Um, and it's just been re-engined and has another life. Does about 24 knots, V-bottom hull. We did a birthday party, or I should say I organised it for Harold Halverson's 90th. Um, and these are three of the boats. Um, I, uh, that was my second Halverson, and I've owned all three. Game fishing style boats, absolutely beautiful. The back one, 57 foot Sonana for Sir Frederick Sutton with a pair of V12 Detroit diesels. It just sounds remarkable boat. One owner, absolutely superb. That's Sonana at the front. We did a parade with 90 vessels participating. I invited the Governor of New South Wales. He turned up. Um, Harold uh, was standing on the front deck of the Silver Cloud and the Governor said, Harold, I've seen a lot of birthday parties, but I've Never seen anything like this. That's after I did the varnish on Sonana, did it myself, 12 coats. Australia's best varnisher in my price range. <laughs> and that's Sonana leading the fleet. That was the 100th anniversary, and I went out and sort of pushed in a bit, and there we were coming into the heads. But you can see what signature vessels they are wherever they go. The motor yacht Emma was the biggest boat that Halverson's built, not the longest, but the biggest, and that set really the Australian boat building world um, on their heels. 90 feet by 22 feet, um, V bottom, uh, twin 43 litre, 1350 horsepower MTU V12 diesels, painted gold, the engine room, just superb. Arthur Nelson, Tobacco Tycoon the most, biggest and most expensive boat in Australia. That's her recently, Mrs Nelson, still going beautifully. She's had it re-engined and redone, and she's had um, shipwright and painter and a boatman for nine years full time. She looks fantastic. And by the way, that's her personal pennant up there. It's a, a witch on the broomstick. Arthur used to put that up there when she was on board. Madam's arrived. And Arthur had the boat built, he found a house at Shell Cove at Caraba Point Neutral Bay and had the boat built to fit the waterfront and when he rang Virginia and said, I found a lovely house at Shell Cove and she said, what's the house like? And he said, oh, I don't know, but it's got a great boat shed. <laughs> and so there, there sits the boat these days. The Halverson Club um, was absolutely responsible for the refurbishment of all these old boats. The Honourable Dr Derek Freeman with the old silver cloud in the middle 
He started in 1991, uh, October, and because of his position as a Member of Parliament and everything, everybody thought, well, if he's doing it, we'll do it as well. And we had wonderful parties and things. I joined um, as a Foundation member. And then that was Harold's birthday. We all came down the river and they took everything out of Bob and Head and the 90 boats backed in within 40 minutes and the old boy, everyone just went past and he was in tears. It was just the most remarkable day. Not one boat got damaged. Uh, it was fantastic. What a birthday party. He came in the next day and took my hand and said, you did all of this and he started crying. It was just remarkable. Best thing I've ever done. Of course, most of the high cruisers have had more hits than Shirley Bassey. Um, there's one of them up on the mud, the Enterprise, but with a private sale and a bit of love and care, that was Enterprise here in Hobart in 2015. They all restore beautifully. Um, that's the Monocco, it's on the end of the wharf, another one, 1947 built, bridge deck cruiser. And that's a, a 36 foot style cruiser, which was the higher boats, they do get up and run with the right engines, and most of them were twin Chrysler engines, so they all did good speeds. And that's that boat with even better finishes today than it would ever have had brand new polyurethane paint, and the owners are fastidious. It is just perfect. A typical 30-foot ex-hire cruiser, but lovingly restored, looking lovely. And it, the little 25, someone's got it in, in Victoria. They love it. Um, what a great way to go boating. That's a, of the traditional sort of lap stroke construction or clinker as we call it. Probably not Halverson's most successful. They were slightly lightly built, but still renovated, done up, and a really great boat. Here's a classic example of a boat's age in dog years. Um, so this is the poor old queen, are looking a bit tragic, but with a bucket of elbow grease and the stiff application of a checkbook, that's her done up. So don't you love the passion? And that's the thing that the Halverson Club and perhaps anything I've ever done brought to it was it made people excited about what they owned and how good it could be and sympathetically restored inside. What a fabulous thing. I couldn't believe it when I got on it. Just divine. That's the old Silver Cloud. Uh, there were uh, three before it, built for Jack Bruce, who had a Commonwealth Film Laboratories. Um, it went into wartime service, HMAS Silver Cloud, and then after the war, Dr. Freeman and the Hannans, various people had it, and then when she was fully restored, um, looking with a multi-million dollar refit, pretty flash. A um, couple of million went into that, but you can't get another one. Harold and Carl, there is the original um, boat that Lars built, job number two, uh, serious from 1925. Carl's smiling, they've got a two-for-one offer on houndstooth jackets. Um, <laughs> but it <laughs> came back to Bob and Head and um, it would have lasted, Harold said it'll go another hundred years, but sadly, one bad owner and all these things come unstuck. She's now um, wrecked. They built yachts and they sailed yachts and they were all great yachtsmen. Harold Carl, the, the uh, Magnus and Trigg, great yachtsmen. This is an early vessel, still on Sydney Harbour. And there's Solvig, which I think was here, Sydney to Hobart race winner. Magnus and Trigg brought great prominence to the family name through their sailing efforts. Um, Sydney Hobart race winners. Um, Anitra is out on the wharf. And, and the fabulous Freya, which won three years in a row. They also participated in the Transpac races and, and their name is just unforgettably linked with Sydney Hobart racing. Great men, tough times, they loved going sailing. Culmination of their sailing and yachting efforts was the building for Sir Frank Packer of Gretel, 1962. This is her being hoisted and lifted, Alan Payne design. Um, the crew tender boat, the clinker hull, and that's about to be sent to America. The only boat to win, or the first boat to win a race against the Americans. So meanwhile, the Halverson Club are having parades at the National Maritime Museum, our host today, and Mary Louise Williams, whom I met at that time, or um, she was a, a wonderfully proactive director of that museum and hosted us for so many events. The old Silver Cloud, Walani II, the last bridge deck cruise of 1963, and the Karingai, which really the owners, it looks like that's 
come out of a bottle. It, it's probably the most immaculate of all the boats. And these are some of the parties we've had. They gave us our own pontoon. Um, wonderful times, fabulous events, and, and, and the Maritime Museum did uh, a, a full Halverson exhibit in the museum, which was a, a knockout. In fact, they've only been on television four times, and three of the occasions they got on the news were through Halverson events. So um, it was very good. I, that was the silver cloud I owned that at that point. And of course, what party would be anything without a party. That's why we're all here, isn't it? So um, this brings the people together. The, the boats are the, the glue that keeps the people together and inspiring people to do something. It saves these boats because you will never have them again. They can't do this anymore. They can't build them anymore. And, and the designers, I think the biggest tribute in my mind is to Harold Halverson because as a 26-year-old man to bring that family together, a dead father, a mother grieving. They've come and had such a struggle from Norway, but to, to, be, to be reborn and to have had his design skills and to have people financially back him, he gave the whole family prosperity and he gave us all the pleasure of the boats. So that's Harold ringing now. Um, I won't tell you about Hong Kong. They went on to build... Um, 750 boats in Hong Kong and China, but a lot of them were fiberglass, so we're not really interested, are we? No? Good. Um, I haven't got the time. I have 36 minutes. There we are. Now, do you have any questions? Oh.